represent certain subspecies of either species under the latest classification. Moving back in time to the colonial era, excavations at the San Diego Royal Presidio occupied from 1769 to 1835 offer insights into the rivals and departure of two bird species. Through recorded um, history, the American crow was absent from South Coastal San Diego County, colonizing only in the 1980s. However, we identified two specimens of the American crow from different contexts within the Presidio, including this tarso metatarsus. The crow is particularly easy to identify because it is the largest passerine in Southern California. Their presence suggests the crow was extirpated, perhaps by shooting and cutting of a riparian woodland in Mission Valley, and after some adaptation, returned more than 100 years later. This sandhill crane fibula was found within the north wing of the Presidio. These large birds occur only irregularly in coastal San Diego County, with only four specific records in the county since 1920. However, historical reports together with this finding indicate that flocks of sandhill crane regularly migrated over Southern California before the turn of the 20th century. Going back further in time, this short-eared owl humerus re was recovered from the La Punta village site at the southeast end of San Diego Bay, documented by the Spanish in 1782 Carbon-14 dates place intact portions of the village deposit between 1500 and 1800 AD. Once more common in our region as a winter migrant, this beautiful owl is listed by California Department of Fish and Game as a species of special concern. The number of short-eared owls that currently reach San Diego Bay and the Tijuana Estuary is now probably fewer than 10 per year. Displacement of wetlands by urban sprawl accounts for their decline. Somewhat weathered, the humerus re was recovered at a depth of zero to 10 centimeters, which highlights the problem, and problem of interpreting the specimen's context. At this site, past floods have partially displaced archeological deposits, making it somewhat questionable as to whether this specimen is prehistoric or modern. If it is part of the archaeological record, it suggests short-eared owls were likely thriving around the San Diego Bay before colonization by the Spanish in 1769. A rare find among prehistoric sites in San Diego is this proximal metatarsal of a pronghorn from the late Holocene village site of Rinconada de Jamo in Pacific Beach. Though the earliest deposits at this site date to the middle Holocene, radiocarbon dates place, this occur place the occurrence of this specimen sometime between 970 and 400 years before present. These native artiodactyls were extirpated from Southern California prior to 1950 and are now endangered in Lower Baja, California. This partially carbonized bone retained two parallel butchery scars highlighted by the arrow, you can't see that well, um, and it is less, it is the less visible articular end of this specimen on the right that readily distinguishes it from mule deer or bighorn sheep. The specimen was confirmed to be pronghorn by DNA analysis as part of a captive breeding and relocation effort involving the San Diego Natural History Museum scientist Kevin Clark. Genetic analysis of California Museum specimens was conducted to identify the subspecies status, the subspecies status of extinct pronghorn populations to best assess genetic and ecological factors important for successful relocation of the captive red pronghorns into their native ranges. Also recovered from this village were these California sea otter teeth, phalanx, metacarpal, and metatarsal bones. Surely prized for their pelts by native people, Otters once abundant along San Diego's, co San Diego's coastline were nearly excavated from the entire California coast in the early 1800s due to commercial fur trading. Sea otter remains are most common among all the marine mammals from San Diego archeological deposits, as well as prehistoric coastal California sites throughout the Holocene. Pictured here are additional sea otter specimens we've identified from four deposits in San Diego County. 
potter remains have also been recovered from sites at Borderfield State Park, Choyas Creek, Point Loma's Ballast Point, the Northern Gateway to Ocean Beach, Rinconada and Pacific Beach, and additional sites on Camp Pendleton. I should note that the photo on the bottom left includes a modern comparative hind flipper and the complete humerus. Sea otters feed, rest, and groom themselves on the ocean surface. They also breed and give birth in the ocean, making them less accessible to capture by native people than other marine taxa, such as harbor seals and California sea lions that haul out on sand beaches to warm themselves and give birth. Indigenous people along our coasts likely utilize the Thule boats to hunt otters. The fact that their fur is so soft and more dense than any other animal with over 1 million hairs per square inch is pro makes it probable that their pelts were more desirable than their meat. In addition to otters, the village of Rinconada also produced these associated Guadalupe fur seal teeth, each of which is shown beneath the corresponding tooth in the modern specimen. Three additional elements also recovered included these forehand, oh, missed that slide, included, oh, included forehand, forefoot, and toe bones. The specimens pictured here are from late Holocene deposits at the village of Yastagua in Sereno Valley, as well as the rock shelter site at Camp Pendleton. Native coastal villagers may have hunted less formidable juvenile Guadalupe fur seals, the distal end of this nardit. Used. Historically, these seals occur off Southern California and the Pacific coast of Mexico. Today, they mainly inhabit Mexico's Guadalupe Island, though small numbers have been documented on Baja California's San Benito Archipelago and the westernmost Channel Island of San Miguel. Thought to be extinct by, by the 1900s due to commercial hunting, Mexican and U.S. protections have resulted in their listing as threatened under the Endangered Species Act and depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. The coastal village site of Spindrift in La Jolla was occupied by indigenous people nearly continuously for close to 10,000 years. Archaeological investigations at the site have revealed a remarkable diversity of all classes of vertebrate fauna, including this rare fragmented ear bone of a northern elephant seal. The blurry green scale on the far left is just shy of 10 centimeters in length, providing some sense of just how large this pestrous temporal bone is relative to the complete modern one on the far right. Elephant seals are the largest of the member, largest member of the Phocidae family next to its southern counterpart, Moronga leonin, with females averaging nine and a half feet in length and close to 2,000 pounds. Males reach 15 feet in length and can weigh up to approximately 2.5 metric tons. They occur off our coast from Baja California's Guadalupe Island north to Point Reyes and haul out on land to molt and breed. Decimated for their blubber during the 1800s, fewer than 100 individuals living on Guadalupe Island remained by the end of the century. Their numbers have rebounded since then, especially in Northern California. These massive animals would have been formidable prey for native people. It's conceivable that injured or sick juveniles or females could have been harpooned or perhaps salvaged after death. The Spindrift Village yield a rich record of Holocene birds with a notable count of 27 species to date. All are known from San Diego historically as well though some reflect changes. The diversity ranges from large pelagic birds, such as the short-tailed albatross, represented by these bones, to osprey, red-throated loon, and passerines, as small as the house finch, the majority are seabirds. The presence of these bones confirm the existence of this pelagic bird along San Diego's coastline in prehistoric times. So many short-tailed albatross bones have been recovered on San Nicolas Island, it would suggest this species may have once nested on the Channel Islands, now highly endangered. The magnificent uh, 
this magnificent bird with a wingspan of up to seven feet occurred with regularity off San Diego coastline until the 1890s when it was pushed to the verge of extinction by plume hunters then by a volcanic eruption on the single island near Japan where it nested. The black-footed laysan uh, and the black-footed and laysan albatrosses are also known off our coast. Specimens shown here include the tarsometatarsus of either a black-footed or laysan albatross recovered from late Holocene context of the village of Nistagua in Sereno Valley. The presence of these albatrosses remains suggests they were more common in prehistoric times than today. It is likely that these seabirds were hunted from Thule boats or perhaps scavenged on the beach. Turning to a significantly more diminutive species of prey, the California red-legged frog is documented from three zooarchaeological assemblages in San Diego County. Reaching just over five inches in length, this native amphibian once occurred along the entire coast of Southern Cal of California, south to the Northwest Baja Peninsula. Com uh, habitat destruction combined with invasive bullfrogs, droughts, and fungal disease resulted in the extirpation of this frog from San Diego County. The last documented sighting was in 1974. It is currently designated as a federally threatened species. The, re the, the red-legged frog is represented at spindrift by three bones, including this fragmented hip bone. Additional specimens were recovered from another site in La Jolla near the Bishop's School and from the rock shelter site in, and from another site in La Jolla, excuse me, and from the rock shelter uh, at Camp Pendleton. Happily, the story of the red-legged frog in San Diego may not be over. Thanks to a multi-decade Herculean effort involving the San Diego Natural History Museum, federal U.S. agencies, and binational conservation organizations, a post-COVID post nail-biting border transfer just recently placed 500 eggs and tadpoles um, from Mexico, brought them from Mexico to the U.S. where they have been reintroduced into a suitable protected pond in northern San Diego County. A follow-up report indicates the tadpoles are well and thriving. The rock shelter site above the lower Santa Margarita on Camp Pendleton, occupied from 730 to 2500 years before present, produced 17 Arroyo Chub specimens, including 13 of these pharyngeal tooth plates. This is a freshwater minnow belonging to the Ciprinidae family, native only to southern, southwestern California streams and creeks. Adults can reach four and a half inches in length. Adapted to drought cycles, these large minnows can survive in shallow, muddy waters during dry years. In spring, when rivers and creeks flow, Females release thousands of eggs, allowing for rapid population proliferation in wet years. Today, the arroyo chub is listed as a species of high concern. The remains of this small fish were also recovered from the rock shelter. It is the only member of the Gasterostidae family found within California. Native to the Santa Margarita River and other coastal streams and rivers in California, Three spine sticklebacks reach approximately three inches. They have an osmotic tolerance that allows them to live in salt water and return to coastal freshwater streams to spawn, though some never go to sea. To see. According to Mark Roeder, the stickleback specimens, along with those of the Royo Chub, are the first freshwater fish ever identified from a San Diego archaeological site. Lastly, one of the most notable instances of avian change in Southern California is the extirpation of the flightless sea duck, Candides lawi. A relative of the scoters and eider, eiders, fossilized remains of this diving sea duck long predate the arrival of humans. The bird's range extended from coastal Oregon to Southern California with the greatest number of specimens coming from the Channel Islands. The Candides femur, uh, shown here in three views is from the Little Sycamore site in Ventura County and dates back 6,000 6, years before present. 
Archaeological remains of this bird have been found at a dozen archaeological sites along mainland coastal California and at two sites on San Nicolas Island. Radiocarbon dating indicate that humans hunted this species for at least 8,000 years before it was driven to extinction around 2,400 years ago. As with this specimen, animal bones from archaeological sites are typically fragmented and sometimes burnt. They may also, oh, there it is. They may also be gnawed, digested, weathered, uh, or weathered, making their identification a challenge. In addition, convergent and evolution may have rendered certain bones of unrelated species similar if they have been used in similar contexts, as we see in the wing bones of wing-propelled divers or the leg bones of foot-propelled divers. Among the bird bones from the Laputa site discussed earlier, what I initially thought to be a shearwater or petrel turned out to be a Cassin's auklet. So clearly, without access to extensive comparative collections like those housed at the San Diego Natural History Museum and LA County Museum, we would know very little about faunal remains from archaeological sites. Thanks to these invaluable reference collections, Zooarchaeology offers a unique window into the past and reminds us that recorded history is just the tip of the iceberg of continuous faunal change. Thank you. That was excellent, Susie. Thank you very much for that. Sure, let me see if I can. We have a couple, we have a couple minutes. Um, if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand, I'll try to see you on the, on the side next to your name. Um, let me see if I can increase the size of my screen. I'm only... Natalie, maybe you can... Um... Uh -oh. Technical difficulties. Maybe you can uh, help me with the questions because I'm having trouble yeah, advancing. I'm looking, I'm looking, but I don't see anybody posting okay. questions in the chat. Everyone's just saying you've done a really great job. Oh, well, I had help from Phil and Aaron and, uh, of course, the collections. So, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Are there any questions for Susie? How are there no questions? And also, I did want to mention, I did hear the story on NPR today, Susie, about the red-legged frogs. Ah, great. And, like the crazy, the, the, the people who were, who were um, moving, moving the frog eggs across the border and, and um, it was, it was quite a rush. Yeah, it was, it got yeah. really gnarly. It almost oh, didn't Bill happen. wants to know, oh, Shannon says, what's the most surprising thing you came across? Well, the, the freshwater fish, but probably my most exciting find was the pronghorn and from my own hometown. I grew up on the south side of Mount Soledad in the Pacifica subdivision and the site, it, it, although it expands way out below Soledad and to the west towards Crown Point, um, this site, uh, the, uh, the location of these came right from my, my own backyard, so to speak. Um, and it's just, and the only other pronghorn I'm aware of came from uh, uh, Deer Springs, was identified by uh, Leslie Quintaro in her master's thesis from San Diego State. Um, so I'd, I'd say that that was pretty exciting. But, but also the birds, I get really excited about the birds. And although I didn't mention it, we identified, or identified um, a minimum, I think it was five individual wood storks from the Carrizo stage stop, and they actually had buckshot holes in them, and they had butchery scars. They were actually eating wood storks of all things. God knows what they taste like. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a question from Alejandra. Go ahead. No. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Okay, no problem. Um, Phil says, tell, tell us more about the king eider. Oh, well, Aaron, why don't you tell us about the king eider? Aaron, Aaron recovered that, or Aaron identified that with Phil. 
You're muted, Aaron. Can you unmute him? Um, so the, the we identified um, um, a king eider or eider. We don't know. We, we are not sure which eider is this, but we think it's a king eider on a site in Spring Valley, uh, which is really surprising uh, because the eiders um, uh, migrate from um, Alaska southwards. Uh, most of their migration is toward Washington State and Oregon, and there are only 40, and this is all I learned from uh, Phil Unit, who is um, uh, in our conversation here, um, only 40 uh, sightings of uh, the eiders were um, reported in California, and there is only a single sighting of the king eider in uh, San Diego. And this is why we think that if uh, the, the, the bone that we have, the scapula that we have, is of um, the king eider. Uh, this is a very rare, as I said, 40 sightings of eiders in all, all over California. Correct me if I'm wrong, Phil. Um, and only one in San Diego. And we found it in a site which is a thousand year old in Spring Valley. Uh, which is about what 15 miles, uh, 20 miles from the coast. Which is uh, so it makes it very interesting. We think uh, because we found at the site uh, some uh, fish and shark and ray bones, we think uh, this eider was probably scavenged at the coast in one of their foraging trips to the coast of the Pacific, the Pacific coast. Yeah. Did you hear me? Yes, and, and you had uh, mentioned that it was found in deposits near the Bancroft Ranch House. Right. Susie Carroll it wants to know if you live in a boat. Based <laughs> on your background. Uh, I spend a lot of time on this boat, yes, uh, the Odyssey. And in a tree house in Julian of late. There's one more question and we'll try to get to it. Um, were you able to identify the crab species, says Gabrielle Morales. Oh, um, usually we don't get crab species, but um, we, uh, I got a lot of crab from the um, Rinconada site and um, uh, we identified 13 different species. And for some reason I'm not able to open my documents while I'm here, but um, they were all like really tiny little crabs, popcorn crabs, and they pr were from all different um, habitats, from tide pools, um, from, uh, uh, from near shore, you know, uh, sand habitats, and from deeper water, even really, one was a very deep water crab. And, and one thing I failed to mention is that some of these animals, like perhaps some of these small freshwater fish, and even maybe some of these crabs, can quite possibly arrive to archaeological sites as stomach contents in some of the birds, some of the seabirds. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's really no way to be certain of, of that. But, but we do know that, you know, Native Americans consumed the smorgasbord of San Diego fauna. And being that San Diego County uh, boasts the greatest number of plants and animals of any county in the United States, and sadly the most the greatest number of endangered and threatened in each case. Uh, the Native Americans living along the coast had a, was just like r truly a smorgasbord. Um, and as I mentioned, especially those living along the coast who had access to coastal canyons and the beaches and estuaries, coastal estuaries and, and such. Well, sorry, I can't remember or I can't access my uh, file that, that I could name all those crabs. But if you're interested, um, email me and I'll send you the list. I'm at sarter at sdnhm.org. Great. Thanks for that, Susie. Um, if there and uh, go ahead. Bill, Bill reminded me that there is a link to our uh, publication of uh, the paper we gave at the uh, Western Field Ornithology meetings, but I, I, I 
don't have it handy uh, is there but i can share it with you if you email me or if you can think of a better way on the spot here phil i think he's trying but again if you have any questions or are interested in, in any of the crabs or what have you uh, i think again i'm at s arter at sdnhm.org Hey, great, Susie. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, here's your last chance. Um, otherwise, we'll, here, let me send out Susie's, I'll put Susie's email in the chat. And we will see everybody at the next lecture. And oh, thanks a lot, Susie. Excellent. Oh, thank thanks, you. Susie. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Ciao. Bye. Bye. <laughs>